Welcome to the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me as always is my Bumble co-host, Kyle, JCRB Kraus. Hi, folks. I'm here. I, I'm ready to read the questions, and I hope Ian is ready to answer them. I certainly hope so, too, because otherwise we don't really have much of a show. No, I guess not. I guess we don't really. Yeah, I guess if we don't do that, then there's no show. So, mm, 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 mm. guess we should answer some questions. We should. This uh, We're continuing our double dose for September, and today we're doing nothing but priority Q&A. Folks who send in questions from Patreon, Ko-fi, or through YouTube. So, let's get through that. And then Wednesday, we're going to have an all-standard Q&A episode. But right now, let's get to that priority Q&A. Yep, let's jump right in right now. We're going to start off with one from Les. Like Aaron Weber and Big the Cat, who's a Sonic character that you enjoy that was initially not shown a lot of love? Uh, there's a few. Like, initially, I hated Big. Like, Right, we, what, we talked about what is them the point? before, yeah. Yeah, like, he's completely out of theme. What are you doing? And then it's like, oh, wait, no, I get it. That's the joke. That is the point. <laughs> that, that's the point. And that's when I learned to stop caring and love the big. Mm -hmm. uh, Cream was kind of in the same boat. It's like, why do we have this non-combatant, sweet little girly girl in my action, serious business hedgehog thing? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, wait, she's also kind of interesting because she's out of that theme she's competent and she's polite and she tries her best and cheese is an absolute godsend on the advanced two bosses and she plays really good against amy in that era no cream's great mm. you know marine won't shut up <laughs> oh wait that's hilarious so <laughs> uh i'm trying to think if there were any for me outside of big like i can't, I can't think of any that were like completely just like i completely threw me off like uh cream cream is just like oh so we have tails so why not another tails-esque character mm. I, I don't know I, I just i can't think of anybody who i'm like yeah i mean yeah what's that character here for they're stupid uh i don't know <laughs> I guess just big, really. I like all of them. They all have they all have likable qualities for the most part. Yeah, I found a reason to love every single one of them to some degree or another. Yes. All right. Well, here's a question from Andrew D. I have to come up with ideas for new trios for Sonic characters. Since I can't give you fan ideas, allow me to instead ask both of you guys what sort of custom Sonic Team trios you'd like to see and what their names might be. You can do this for Classic as well. You can also include the Team Sonic Racing concept of mixing and matching characters from already existing teams if you want, but give the teams a cool new name. <sighs> the teams themselves are not hard. The team name, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you have team, cl team Classic, consisting of Mighty, Ray, and Classic Sonic. So I suppose. There's one. You have the Strong Arm... Amy, Ray, and Mighty. Yeah. Hedgehog Havoc. Get you your Sonic Shadow and Silver in there. Mm hmm Team Hog. <laughs> <laughs> Whole Hog. It's something like that. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I just imagine that, that Silver's suggestion. Or no, Sonic suggests it out of a joke. Silver thinks it's legit and loves it, and Shadow's like, I'm not calling us that. <laughs> Which just makes Sonic double down on it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then they all start doing it. And even Shadow <laughs> even Shadow says it once, and he's like, Aw, oh, damn. <laughs> That's what you get for challenging a whole hog. He said it! He said it! Aw, <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I like it. I like it. Ah, oh, jeez. You got your you got your team metal. You can do Metal Sonic, Mecha Sonic, and not Silver Sonic, whatever Sonic 2's Metal Sonic is called. I don't I don't remember. That's Mecha version one. Mecha one and then Mecha two. Okay, whatever. You take <laughs> Mecha three out of Mothballs from Adventure One. Something like that. Uh 
Hmm. I don't think. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here's a good one. The B team. Charmy, Cream, and Tails. <laughs> Again, they're all flight characters. And Charmy assumes that, that by that name, he's the leader. Of course. It's the B team. <laughs> uh, Charmy, it's not. Okay, sure. <laughs> what do you think we should do, boss? I don't know. What should we do? We should do this. Yeah, okay. I'm the leader. Follow me. Yeah, Charmy. Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. Cream is the kind of de facto core to Chow Squad. You've got cheese, you've got chocolate, and you got chaos. <laughs> of course, you got chaos. Chaos, get him! <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Apparently, there's also a chow named Milk. Yeah, that's like super, super obscure, but you know me. Mm -hmm. There's also Omo Chow. Mm. We haven't seen Omo Chow in a long time. Yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Team Boom would be what? Sticks, Boom, Knuckles, and mm, Dave. <laughs> yeah, it's Dave. <laughs> not quite sure how that is going to work out gameplay wise, but you know what? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Dave's Dave's the fast one, but w which is weird because you think he'd be uh, on his break. But, you know, or just could be the same team boom you had in Worlds Unite, which would be Sticks, Fastidious, Bieber, 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 Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is. And Comedy Chip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. I think that's enough. <laughs> now we're starting to uh, scrape the bottom of the barrel, I think. <laughs> Next question is from Alphamon Oriuken. So according to the complete Sonic Comic Encyclopedia, Onux, Anti Knuckles, from Moebius, apparently founded a group called the Orderix. That's the, that's a horrible name. <laughs> to protect Demon Island from intruders, obviously making them counterpart to the Chaotix. But during a flashback of the Scourge taking over Moebius, Onux was the one was the only one seen defeated. So my question is, were the Orderix formed before or after Scourge's takeover? And furthermore, just who are the Orderix? Who are their members? And what exactly what exactly differentiates them from their prime zone counterparts? My inner Sonic nerd must know. Um, number one, screw you, Orderix is brilliant. Chaotix? <laughs> Orderix. But Chaotix is a pun. Orderix is just stupid. <laughs> and it's derivative. That's the whole point of the antiverse. I, I, there is no greater thought put into it. It's the opposite. It is the mirror mirror. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. There's no greater thought put into it. Oh, man. I like that. That's good. That's good right there. Anyway, go ahead. And that's the fun of it, is you go, oh, yeah, this is the dumb mirror universe, and you roll with it. <laughs> of course, but it's very important. Those characters are also super duper important. Mm, so much so that we never actually saw them. <laughs> uh, and part of that reason is that, you know, for that one flashback scene, we weren't going to go through and design like a dozen characters just to show them beaten up on the floor. That's not a wise use of resources um i don't think we ever got too deep into planning them because it was gonna be a long long time before we got to delve into that toy box of stuff again but i was saying that it would be the chaotix again but the in the prime universe the chaotix were more of a loose collection of friends that just happened to rally together around nux they, they were kind of a freedom fighter team, but they weren't as structured as like Sally's team. At least that's how it came across to me. It was kind of like Knuckles saying, uh, guys, I need some help. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And they all come together to move a couch or beat up Eggman, whatever's you know, on the agenda for the day. 
Um, the Ordericks, however, would be Onux's Gestapo. They would be his enforcers. They would be militarized and highly organized and competent, but they would just hate each other. They were there out of obligation of duty, not because of any reason that they wanted to actually hang out. Um, beyond that, it would be probably your pretty standard uh, flip of character personalities. So, you know, Vector was kind of the dumb but well-meaning wannabe. So, anti-Vector would be, uh, let's see, just like cruel and dismissive and very self-aware. You know, that type of thing. Charmy is your optimistic, gregarious, happy-go-lucky fella who ran away from his duties in the Golden Hive colony. So anti-Charmy would be insulting and standoffish and exiled for something horrible, that kind of thing. <laughs> Anti-Charmy murdered somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Anti-Mello died. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Oh no, my best friend was poisoned. Nobody's falling for that, sir. Mm -hmm. Screw you, I'll poison you too. <laughs> uh, I need anti charmy. All right, anything else on that one? Uh, that kind of delves into Lost Hedgehog Tales territory, so I don't want to go too deep. Okay. All righty then. Here's this one from Scruffy Matt. Happy? Sonic Colors Ultimate Week. Well, judging by some of the player feedback, maybe not so happy. But anyway, quickly off the top of your heads, what are your favorite levels and music tracks from Sonic Colors and your favorite Wisp or Wispin from any Sonic game? Okay, Sweet Mountain. That track is just amazing. I do love Sweet Mountain. They're all so yeah. good. There's like there's no bad music in Colors for sure. Like, no, not at all. Its soundtrack is stupendous. But Sweet Mountain Act One, just that big bombastic uh, mm -hmm. brass band, just going nuts, is ah, oh, I love it. 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 Um, all the chip tuny versions of all the tracks in the game world, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, like you said, it's all great. Yeah. Uh, Maybe second place would be Meteor Coaster because that just you're rocking out to that one. The Man, entire time. I, I always have a soft spot for Tropical Resort and Aquarium Park. Mm, 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 mm. Those are the big those are the big ones for me. But I mean there's like Terminal Velocity Act 2 is really good. <laughs> Planet Wisp. Planet Wisp Planet is, is 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 a I say Planet Wisp is maybe a slightly overdone just because of its inclusion in generations and and I don't know, it feels like it's the one level that colors gets revisited the most and it's like well come on there's other levels in that game too <laughs> yeah but, but at know, the same time it, it's it, the wisps home world it's right kind of central to the plot and it is just a beautiful track yes yes and the level's really cool too so i mean there's mm -hmm. there's definitely no problem with it so it's like yeah i get it but still at the same time it's like come on there's other there's other good stuff too it's all so good yeah <laughs> <sighs> Uh, favorite wisps? I've probably drill. And yeah, drill is the most fun. Like whether you're carving through the earth or just shooting through the water, like drills just fun. Yeah, La laser you got to aim, hover you got to time it. Block requires thinking. Drill you just just go. <laughs> yeah, dr <laughs> yeah, drills, ju drills just got a freaking, <laughs> freaking massive drum and bass, <laughs> just going, going ham <laughs> in the background as you're drilling through the world. Yeah, that's great. I like that a lot. Um, Frenzy is also pretty fun too, but yeah, drill is drill is a good time. Good time. I never played the. DS version, so I don't have a ton of experience with the exclusive ones there, like Burst and Lightning and whatnot. Um, and when it comes to the Wispons, I don't know. Like they're all different, sure, but they also feel kind of samey in that they all just wreck whatever's in front of you. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> that just that just gives Whisper a good excuse to just wreck whatever's in front of her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like it. Here's a question from Pandolce. 
In the scenario in which Dr. Eggman actually completed Eggman Land, how would Dr. Stylane react to visiting it and seeing it in operation? Well, he did build it and unleashed, so you can just assume Starline was there. You know, he's he's touring the park. He's buying souvenirs. He's exchanging real money for egg bucks. He's having the time of his life. Meanwhile, Sonic is zipping around, turning into Werehog, fighting robots, trying to live in that 30-minute freaking level. <laughs> and Starline's going, it's a world of pain and a world of strife. Oh, I, I just love it. <laughs> He is buying up all the Eggman merch and to to in- increase the size of his Eggman shrine at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. And now that it's gone because the world got put back together, he has an immaculate collection. That thing is worth bajillions, but he will never sell a thing. Nope. Because it's his. Uh-huh. Yep. And he still has it even after they're falling out. Because of course he does. Here's one from Phyllis. Hey, Ian and Kyle, my question is, in Sonic Universe number 29, when Scourge's quills get shaved, it looked pretty painful to him. Are his quills a mix of quills and hair, or were they really shaving his quills? And how long would it take to grow back on him? I think his expression is more indignation that it's being taken from him. You know, how dare you touch his personage? You're taking away his spines. That's, you can't do that. Back off. I don't think it actually was causing him physical pain. Uh, as for how long it would take for them to grow back, I don't know. Um, I don't think we've really established how long or how much they grow because Sonic got his through Deus Ex Machina and arguably so did Scourge. So uh, I don't know. I I I don't know. If the story had continued, maybe he would have kept the short spines just to help him look a little different. Or maybe they would have grown in in between stories just to show how quickly they grow in. I don't know. I don't know. Could be played either way. Hmm. Interesting. Here's a question from Happy Times. If Whisper's Wispun was broken or lost and she was forced into a fight, would she still be able to fight using her wisps similar to how Sonic uses them? Oh, I hope so. I really hope so, because that would be just the coolest freaking scene. Variable response broken on the floor. She's backed into a corner. What is she going to do? And she throws a haymaker that is now suddenly all pink and spiked. You know, (laughs) throws a kick that's now a blue block. Just wrecks people with mixed martial arts that are based on wisp powers. I have no idea if Sega would let us do that which is why I put up, you know, I wish, I hope, because it kind of seems like the sort of thing where would they say, you know, only Sonic gets Wisp powers, which would just drive me up the freaking wall. But maybe, maybe they'd be cool about it because they were cool about the variable Wisp on. I was quite sure that that was going to get some kind of note or caveat or restriction, but no, they were cool with it. (laughs) So maybe they would be cool with Whisper and her close buddies just going nuts on somebody because god that would be so freaking cool <laughs> um and there is precedent because the one note i did get was that the wisps will only grant their power to people that they trust which was actually i think a plot point in the colors animation come to think of it so that's consistent yeah so maybe i mean it's there it could be done <laughs> in theory and it would be so cool or you know Whisper's in trouble and Tangle's the only one to help, but she is woefully underpowered. So the Wisps empower her to help Whisper out. You know, I just, oh, there could be so many cool things to be done there. (laughs) Ah, I just, so in short, maybe. (laughs) By God, it's Whisper with the steel chair. (laughs) Here she comes. (laughs) Rocket. Laser! Steel chair! (laughs) Yes. Oh, yes. I love Whisper so much. She is so badass. (laughs) Off the top rope! Cube! (laughs) Outstanding! Amazing! (laughs) I miss games that have announcers like that. I'm glad Sonic Colors is one of them. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> it, it honest to God added something to the game, especially in that final moment uh-huh. where the announcer just goes, all oh, colors. And it's like, hell yeah, it is. <laughs> uh... Taste the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Amazing. Outstanding. <laughs> Oh man, awesome! Did they say awesome? I think he said awesome. Is that one of Probably. them? Probably. I it's, think so. It's been a while since I played. Multi kill. I... <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Headshot. <laughs> kill a Manjaro. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you killed me. Here's a question from Scurvy Pirate Hog. We've talked about Sonic crossovers between Boom and Modern, Modern and Classic, but you just, for the pure fun of it, what do you think of a crossover between Modern Sonic and Sonic Sat AM? What would that be like? Uh, depends on how extensive the crossover is. It's like, which, which direction are we going? <laughs> yeah. Like, if we just swapped Sonics... That would be interesting. Or if we swapped casts, like if Sonic and crew got plopped into Knothole and the Freedom Fighters got plopped into Sonic's world modern day, how would how would that do? You know, or mix and match. Mm-hmm. Are we doing like a Worlds Collide thing where the Robotniks are teaming up and thus the two teams team up and do? It depends on how you play it, but that's probably overcomplicating the question. Uh let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. The dichotomy between the principal characters would be, you know, the first thing to mine, of course. Uh modern Sonic is so much more laid back and I don't want to say friendly, but positive, I guess. No, that's not quite right either. No, I don't think so. I kind of know what you mean, but I'm I don't know how to yeah, because like Sat AM Sonic is definitely positive. You know, he's He's also fairly laid back, to be fair. Yeah, but he's got there's something about that nineties attitude that modern Sonic doesn't have. Right. Modern Sonic is more of a snark, and Sat AM Sonic is more Bart Simpson. Classic Bart Simpson. God, I gotta make that distinction too. <laughs> I don't know, it, it's a <laughs> It's a nuanced thing. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. But I feel like he's maybe a little more hyperactive. I don't know. It's it's a very, very finite distinction. And I think at first they would kind of grate on each other just a little bit. But that much ego in the same room, that's going to happen no matter what. But ultimately they would you know, just revel in how cool the both of them are as they save the day. Um. I see Tails being a little off put with the younger, very dependent set AM Tails. Mm-hmm. But that Tails, he would see a lot of his younger self in there, which is pretty applicable, to be honest. And set AM Tails aspires to do more. So having a mentor in himself, encouraging him to get out there and do, would be incredibly wholesome. Um, having Tails and Rotor geek out. That's kind of a given. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess one of the okay. Here's where you can make the most immediate distinction between the Sonics is Sat Am Sonic would raz the hell out of Antoine, and modern Sonic would be like, "Dude, chill. He's doing his best." Right. Yeah. And then, okay. And then Antoine would say something that just puts his foot in his mouth, and modern Sonic would be. <sighs> Okay, buddy, I I just vouched for you. Could could you not? <laughs> but Sat AM Sonic could be a bit of a bully. Not saying that Antoine didn't instigate on more than one occasion, but I see modern Sonic being more patient in that regard, or at least less antagonistic. Yeah, yeah. So that modern Sonic modern Sonic's not the kind of Sonic who would say patients are for hospitals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While uh Sat AM Sonic did say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh Amy and Bunny would just be glorious on the battlefield together, just wrecking stuff. Oh yeah. Um 
Knuckles would be very confused why they think the time stones are on his island. What? Uh, that's a deep cut joke. If nobody <laughs> remembers that. <clears throat> mm, yeah. Some weird things going Sally, on there. Sally, it's kind of hard to find an analog to, but maybe she's the one who brings everyone together. Right. You know, yep. you've got the very loose collection of friends from the modern universe and you've got the close knit team of the freedom fighters who, you know, are out of their element, maybe. And Sally's the one to bring them together into one cohesive, productive force. If anyone could get two Sonics to listen and do something productive, it would be her. <laughs> yes. And she's and... she's very much annoyed by both of them, except secretly she <laughs> loves loves that there's two of them. <laughs> and as for the Eggman, Robotniks, however you want to spin it. I mean, uh, they'd probably get along pretty well. Would, yeah. Yeah, they would. I think. Yeah. Modern Eggman, him, modern Eggman, Eggman would be... and Robotnik. They're pretty. They're both pretty brutal. They're both pretty uh, iron fisted. They are. It's just Eggman enjoys his presentation more than Robotnik. Robotnik is more about results. Yeah, but Robotnik also had a flair to him, you know? A little bit, a little bit, but, you know, those you can kind of count on one hand. You had the super fast cheetah bot, you had that giant war of the worlds deforesting robot, but a lot of it was standard issue badniks and hover pods. Sure, you know? sure, sure. The doomsday drones were menacing, but they were UFOs. Mm -hmm. They're nothing like the badniks or, you know, the giant floating robot on terminal velocity even you know eggman has an orbital elevator that moves extremely fast but it's snail shaped that kind of nonsense <laughs> so yeah um and to that degree i could almost see orbot and cubot kind of preferring robotnik's directness until they get threatened with being tossed in the scrap heap and they're like no 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 maybe we'll go back meanwhile snively is rather enamored with the idea of an Eggman who isn't threatening him at every given moment and is kind of fun to work with until Eggman actually does threaten to throw him into the recycle bin. <laughs> and he's like, no, wait, I'll go with what I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Orbot and Cubot hate Cluck. Cluck just keeps <laughs> like <laughs> oh, antagonizing <absolutely>. them, of course. <laughs> like, that's just the running gag in the background is Cluck is pecking on Cubot. Of course, yep, yep. <laughs> nobody helps him nobody calls attention to it it's just if there's a scene set with the villains you just hear him in the background going <laughs> beautiful just beautiful you know the uh, story wraps up everyone's going home and he's just kind of schlepping along holding one dismembered arm goodness what happened to you friend can we just go home now <laughs> Uh, the villains, the, a villain crossover sounds way more fun than the crossover with the <laughs> heroes. <What> the heck, <laughs> man! <laughs> I guess that's how it usually goes. <laughs> Let's move on to our next question here from Noni. Hey, does Shadow need to eat, or is it more of a wants to sort of thing? I imagine he needs to, but could probably last longer than other living things uh, he's the ultimate life form so you know, maybe he can endure starvation conditions longer than anyone else but so he I claims would... that he's the ultimate life well... form. <laughs> i mean it's not his name on the franchise he only has one no. game <laughs> yeah I... <laughs> yes i mean just so he claims <laughs> now I'm imagining Sonic, you know, he actually wants to know this now. So he's just starts stalking Shadow, waiting for him to eat something. Just eat, <laughs> prove the point. Come on. And then he sees him stop at one of those chili dog stands. Like, ah, he does eat and he eats the best thing. And, you know, he gets the dog and he glares. Says, That's not what I ordered. And just like wipes all the chili off the dog. And Sonic's just scandalized. <laughs> 
Why do you keep coming up with Sonic Boom plots? There's no more <laughs> Sonic Boom. But you keep doing it. Like we on this show, there's like several times you've come up with we've especially you, you've come up with brilliant Sonic Boom plots and they're just they're just wasted. <laughs> I'm sorry, signori, what do you want on your dog? Raw coffee beans. <laughs> Sonic just zips up, slaps that out of his hand. No. <laughs> beg your pardon. No. And then they fight for like three continents. Of course. Of course. <laughs> because that's how it goes. And the battle track is sweet, Mountain, because I'm getting everything I want in this scenario. Of course. Perfect. Brilliant. <laughs> and our last question before we take a quick break is going to be from Digama. And they want to know exactly how sus are these imposters? You're going to know pretty much everything there is to know about them by the end of the miniseries. But the situation and everything about them, it's it's pretty messed up. Honestly. It's it's pretty sus. <laughs> it, it's it's not it's not a pretty picture. Oh, but boy. hopefully it's entertaining at least. Oh, boy. I, mean, I hope the pictures are pretty. Don't uh, disparage whoever yeah. the artist is in that issue or on those issues. Actually, I should say metaphorically metaphor i am i know <laughs> all right well with that we're gonna take a real quick break and then we'll be right back with more bumblecast goodness on the bumblecast yes i said bumblecast twice what are you gonna do about it <laughs> And we are back and ready to jump back into these lovely priority questions. We're starting off here with this one from Off. Do you ever regret mentioning mandates or specifically using the term mandates? I inherited that. I was going to say not something I started. Yeah, that was yeah, you did, you weren't the first one necessarily to say mandate. No, that entire idea as it was presented originated on another writer's web forum way way back in the day and was the first time to clue in a lot of the young fans yeah a licensed book works under restrictions yeah sorry that's how it goes and for whatever reason the word itself mandates became a sticking point and a rallying cry and and i've tried to stop using the word because i think at this point it's lost its actual meaning yes it absolutely has so it's like yes the licensor has rules for its property you have to work with that that's the way it has been since things were licensed that's life sorry are you telling me are you telling me that Ian, that you don't control every aspect of everything about Sonic. Kyle. Yeah. We still have half a show to do. Yeah. Could you not? <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, this is what yes. you, this is what you have to deal with. But yeah, no. <laughs> yes. Yes. I put myself out there and I try to be informative, but I just because I talk a lot doesn't mean I'm right or have authority. <laughs> There's or, a lot of podcasts out there that prove that people can say a whole lot of stuff and it can be fluff. So, I mean, I try to be honest. I try to be as accurate as I can be, but you know, I could be wrong about some stuff. Stuff can change. And there you go. Right. <laughs> Bumblecast, take us with a grain of salt. Yeah, I think I think people get way too hung up on a lot of this stuff, and yeah, yeah they, they think you have a lot more power than you do, and uh, it's just weird. <laughs> it's like, do, do, is like what? I I just don't understand half the time, most of the time, but whatever, whatever. Here's a question: I, mean, I can understand. Oh. I can understand the folks thinking that I have some kind of seniority because I've been on the book for so long, but that isn't, that doesn't really do much for me. It's more of a, I just work well within that system and they haven't fully replaced me yet. So that's <laughs> all that is. 
Yes. Oh, well. Here we go. We got a question here from Kaloki. Good day. So, the Sonic the Hedgehog cast have no idea that tons of people scrutinize every part of their existence and media. My question is, how would the main cast react to suddenly finding out what's beyond the fourth wall and discovering how much people know about them? Sonic would be kind of pleased with the extra attention and then not care. You know, he's a world famous hero in his own continuity, knowing that there's an entire other level of perception that knows about him. You'd be like, Hey, neat. And then that's it. Um, Amy and Dales would be way more self-conscious about it. Um, I think tails more so just because he is a lot more self analytical, I suppose. I think Amy has been discovering herself enough and is comfortable enough with herself that she would weather the scrutiny a bit better. Um, Cream would be intimidated just in that, you know, small child thrust into a large room of people type of thing, but she's savvy enough. She would be able to handle it. Um, Knuckles would be a little paranoid about it because how many people have been watching the island without him knowing about it? (laughs) But ultimately they haven't done anything. So, okay, he doesn't care anymore. Eggman would just mug for the camera nonstop, you know, his every waking moment would become a vlog showing, you know, the fourth wall, just how ingenious he really is until he really just gets out of patience with it. And then he would find a way to bomb the fourth wall closed again, because darn it. He wants time to himself. He doesn't need you looking over his shoulder. He'll come (laughs) conquer that dimension later. First, he has to destroy that pesky blue hedgehog and big doesn't care. (laughs) Of course he doesn't. (laughs) Uh, Big, you are the figment of somebody's imagination. Everything that you live and die for will be for the entertainment of an entire other universe that perceives you as a gag character at best. Okay. (laughs) I mean, that's kind of how I'd feel. (laughs) Everyone else out there is trying to find themselves, and he's going, Froggy, where are you? (laughs) Is that where Froggy went? (laughs) (laughs) Big achieved Nirvana at the beginning of his life. Of course. He's the most Zen character of them all. Genius. He's smarter than all of us, that's for sure. (laughs) Sticks would feel vindicated. (laughs) (laughs) I knew it! (laughs) It's true, it's all true! (laughs) Uh, what about some of the IDW cast? What do they think? Um, Whisper would hate it. She would absolutely hate it and kind of turn inward. She hates any attention to begin with. I mean, any more. Yeah, she would. Yeah, she would absolutely. Tangle would have this like five second period of, oh, that's weird. And then, hey, everybody, look what I can do. Swings off trees. Yeah, I mean, she would go full on vlog, too. (laughs) She I feel rough like and, rough and tumble would find it weird. And then they'd get paranoid that someone was going to snitch on them all the time. <laughs> and Starline who spent so much time scouring the planet using the warp topaz would go, Oh yeah, it's you guys. I've been watching you this whole time and you didn't know. Mm. <laughs> and by the way, you're disgusting. That's gross. What are you doing? <laughs> all right here's a question from joe papa do rings exist and have a use in the idw canon or is it simply a gameplay exclusive element like monitors and springs um i guess it's a gameplay element at this point uh weren't there some springs at least early on i think but yeah like it's i kind of was on the fence of it early on in the book because what do rings count as in the game universe? They're kind of a currency, but that seems to be more in game than it is in the meta context. Yeah. And in previous media, their power level fluctuated wildly. I was like, well, if we bring them in, they need to have a set 
power. They need to do something so they aren't, you know, a MacGuffin that can do anything. And by the time we reach the end of season one, it's like, well, we haven't really touched on it at all. I guess we'll just keep rolling with it. I mean, maybe Evan will introduce them down the line. I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. It's such a uh, iconic part of the franchise, and yet it also doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, it, it's never really served a narrative purpose. No the chaos emeralds, sure. No, the 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 narrative purpose was always more Archie comics specifically that 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 domain. That's the right. one that started playing with them, like as a making them more important. Well, except for I guess the power ring, uh, power ring things from uh, Sad AM, right? So, and Archie took its cues off of that, right? Yeah, no other meat, no other Sonic Media has really played with rings in that way, outside of a gameplay element. So, hmm. <sighs> intriguing. Speedweed has a question. I know some people compare Sonic and Shadow to Goku and Vegeta, respectively, what with the similarities between Dragon Ball and Sonic, but would it be better to compare Shadow to Virgil? Maybe it's both because they're edgy, while their rivals are food-loving, laid-back, wacky, woohoo butt-kickers. What do you think? Uh, it's hard to, for me to say because I'm not super familiar with the Devil May Cry series. I'm assuming that's the Virgil he's talking about uh, uh, is, compared to Dante. Is there is there a Virgil in uh, Dragon Ball? Mm, no. no. Okay. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure he means Dante and Virgil. Oh, okay. Okay. Pretty sure. Um, and correct. Comment below to correct me as I blunder through this one, but I think they're more of a brotherly thing, and it's kind of opposing viewpoints. Whereas Sonic and Shadow are very removed from each other. They don't have any kind of bond outside of they have comparable power levels to trot out a Dragon Ball Zism. Uh And I don't know. I mean, yeah, Dragon Ball has been incredibly influential on media for the past, God, what, 20, 30 years? <laughs> it's probably closer to 30, yeah. God. but I don't know when you step back far enough, it just kind of becomes more of the odd couple rivalry type of thing. Right. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of Dragon Ball parallels because of there are so many direct links, but I think if you get too into the weeds on the rivalry and try to build too many connections, you're losing, you're doing a disservice to the characters on both sides. So I was talking to Aaliyah about this in case she knew anything more devil may cry e and she said you know conceivably possibly dante and virgil might be more of a shadow eclipse dynamic maybe hmm. um but you know at the same time you don't want to get too deep into the comparisons because then it becomes you're just trying to make one character fit the mold of another one and it doesn't always work that way if you look at it as far as, you know, Dante and Goku are the much more free spirited seeking adventure types, then sure, that comparison can be made to Sonic. If you want to say Vegeta and Virgil are the more stoic business oriented, you know, get things done type of mentality. Sure, that can be applied to Shadow. But I think if you go any, if you zoom in any closer than that, it's going to start falling apart and then. Then you lose some of the fun of it. Mm. I know very little about DMC, other than uh, you need to fill your dark soul with light. That's all. That's that all Devil it. Trigger is one of the best pieces of music ever composed by mortal man. Devil Trigger is amazing. It's a great song. Yes. Here's a question from the Hobo Joe. Some time ago, I asked about Jeff Smith's bone, and was excited to hear what you had to say. However, something I'm surprised you didn't mention was the fact that Netflix is developing an animated version. I'd love to hear your take, hopes, fears. Out of all the close calls, this is the one I have the most faith in, especially after the success of Invincible. I'd love if it ended up looking like Hilda or have the fluidity of green eggs and ham. That'd just take time and we'd be dust when it finally releases. I'm just worried about the Bone Cousins voices. I think James Earl Jones would have been 
great for the Great Red Dragon 20 years ago, and I just feel I just fear it'll get overlooked. Um, in part because one, I hadn't heard of it <laughs> to be honest, and number two, like you said, there's been a lot of bone projects that have been announced as being in development and then just didn't go anywhere. Uh, I do remember seeing a little bit of the old Telltale Games bone game that I don't know how well that did or how far it went into the series. I just remember seeing the snippet of it and it's like, okay, it looks all right, but the voice acting is so bland. Like the great red dragon needs to have a voice to it that has a presence while still being very laid back. Kyle, for reference, the great red dragon is this ludicrously powerful figure in the narrative Mm -hmm. who only shows up a handful of times before the big climax when he shows up you know it's a big deal and half the time it's played as a joke you know just (laughs) all of a sudden here is this epic figure who's just there being super casual and then he says something cryptic that means something and disappears and you're like oh come back and be cool more it's he's very much a lesson in less is more great red dragon is great (laughs) but part of that is when he shows up and when he does something it's a big deal Mm -hmm. so you need someone who has the way of being very laid back in their presentation uh vocally and then when stuff goes down it makes a transition that makes sense uh i wonder if james earl jones would have been too intense of a voice i mean moot point now sadly but I don't know. I mean, he was a fantastic voice actor and just got that voice just to listen to it in general would be great. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if he would have just been too intense. I'm thinking maybe, maybe just cause I just recently saw Shawshank Redemption, but Morgan Freeman, that kind of resonating uh, honey of a voice that you are just enraptured with the minute he starts speaking something that has gravitas when he's saying almost nothing of consequence type of thing that I think (laughs) might've worked a little better, but there's, there's a million interpretations that you could go with for sure. Um, And a lot of the characters, the, the weird thing about bone is there is some solid high fantasy to be had. So you want the voice cast to be serious enough in their roles, especially with grandma Ben and Thorne but the bones themselves are cartoon characters just straight up. So phone and smiley and um, phony, they, they need to have cartoon voices. They need to be characters, but they need to fit into that high fantasy setting. That is the rest of it. And that is a weird mishmash to do. It can be done. You have the right voice director. You have the right cast. It can be done, I'm sure. But it would be a lot trickier than something that is kind of universally one theme, if you dig me. Hmm. So, I mean, hopefully the animated series pulls it off. I would love it if they did. I actually just recently read through Eye of the Storm the other day because of, oh, God, Kyle, just the sequence where they're, they're sneaking through the forest during the middle of a thunderstorm. And I've got the original black and white editions, which I kind of prefer, but that's that's entirely me. And because of sequences like this, where they're sneaking through the forest and it's pouring rain and they know that the rat creatures are hunting them in the night. And then there's just, you know, a couple of panels of heavy, heavy inks as the rain is coming down and the lightning flashes and it reveals the field. And there's just countless rat creatures. And one of them is just looking right at you. And it's like, oh my God, this is terrifying. (laughs) All you have is like sound effects and black and white and oh, so good. So freaking good. And like every moment of King Doc early on. Okay, I'm getting off track. Wow. To your point, I hope the animated series does well. I hope they get it right. We'll just wait and see. Uh, Hobo Joe has a question for you, Kyle. All righty. Kyle, I feel bad you got left out last time. And this time, too, I guess, since I went on a tangent. That's fine. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about Bowen, really. So <laughs> so is there any property, comics or otherwise, you'd really be excited to get it adapted? After Bone and Invincible, I'd love to see Usagi Yojimbo realized. Almost came to Samurai Jack. 
I really want to see that rabbit done justice. Yeah, uh, a full Usagi Yojimbo series would be fantastic, a full animated series. Um, I really dug his appearance in the uh, 2012 TMNT uh, 2012 series. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel like something akin to that would work out really well um, for a full-on just solo Usagi series. I would love that. Um, let's see. Jeez. I mean, I don't know if you're not, you didn't really. Okay. You, you did specify any property. So it doesn't have to necessarily be comics. Um, I mean, I'm a fall back on shovel Knight. <laughs> shovel Knight's a good mm, one. Yeah. A shovel Knight series animated series would be fantastic. Um, same with Shantae. They're both like, they're both ripe for, in animated style as it is. I mean, just take those character designs, plop them into animation. You're, you're going, you're done. You're golden. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'd love to see. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really the best I got. Um, I don't really have anything to add necessarily onto those two. Really? I just think they would be uh, really solid. You could you could do really good adaptations for uh, for both of them. So, yeah. Here's a question from Sonic, Sonic, Sonic. Where do the rings and the Chaos Emeralds go when we don't see the characters holding them? Into the character's body or hammer space? I don't know. Like, rings, it's pretty clear they get absorbed because they kind of just dissolve into twinkles. <laughs> and after you drop them, they eventually bounce and disappear. You could say they're some form of hard energy that transfers states. Sure. No problem. Chaos. Emeralds, I don't know. Well, they're, they're, ca like, they're chaos. That's literally in their name. So, you know, like they tuck it behind their back and it's gone. And then they reach behind their back and they pull it out. It's, it's cartoon hammer space. That's the best I got. <laughs> uh, they just need more control over hammer space so they can just yoink it right out of Eggman's hands or whatever. <laughs> They need, so they what need you're saying is they that. need more chaos control? Yes. Yes, that is absolutely what I am saying. <laughs> Here's a question from Dove. Ian, if you were going to permanently switch the alignment of two characters in Sonic, hero to villain or villain to hero, who would it be and why would they turn? Uh, if I had to? Like, I've been stewing on this one for a bit. Mm -hmm. And... I don't want to do it with anybody, really, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I, I would like, I almost would want to kind of do it, but I'd also like to see a redemption for them, too. That's the thing. It's like, thing. but it, like, if it's permanent, uh, that's the, like, OK, if you go with Tails, because that's kind of the obvious one, the disillusioned protege, he's got the brains of Eggman, the skills of Sonic, pull a Thalog arc with him and he decides to outgrow them both. And he goes on a. A heel turn yeah okay that's that could be fun for an arc but i feel like the tales fans would be betrayed because he is a good person deep down that's this whole thing is you know he follows sonic because he's an equally good and heroic person he just ha doesn't have the confidence or necessarily the skill to back it up just yet um i don't think you could do it with amy because even if you gave her the best possible reason for a heel turn the collective consciousness would just go, oh, jilted lover, he, he, he. It's like, no, that's a disservice to the character. Don't do that. Plus, she's out of all the possible heroic characters, she's just the nicest and the most positive and supportive. I I cannot think of a reason to give her an ad antagonistic swap over that doesn't involve demon possession or something, <laughs> some kind of outside force. She's just... She's too good of a person. Sure. You can't do it. Sonic would turn evil before she would. <laughs> um, Knuckles, maybe just to put some teeth back into him. You know, Aaliyah reminded me of this earlier. There was a alternate cover for the 30th anniversary special. That was a reenactment of the bridge scene out of Sonic 3, where Knuckles blows out the bridge and dumps Sonic and Tails down the waterfall. And a bunch of the 
up and coming young readers were going, why would Knuckles do that to his friend? And it's like, children, in my day, <laughs> Knuckles was the rival. We didn't have none of these edgy shadows. He was the rival. And <laughs> going back to our DBZ parallels, he's the Piccolo. He was the badass rival to the hero, and now he's kind of the and Knuckles. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Knuckles. I feel so bad for him. <sighs> But you know, wh- why would he go evil? What, what would he? What would he do? What would? What would drive him to be antagonistic to everybody? I don't know. I'm sure he's a little... What if it's like he's exposed to the equivalent of red kryptonite in Sonic's world? Whatever. Yeah, Jeez. maybe. But then that's that's not a character change. That's that's an excuse. I know. It's... I know. That's all I can think of. I or mean, maybe maybe Knuckles go full on goes full on isolationist and he's like nobody is allowed on this island. You are <laughs> okay. Have fun on your floating rock. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like he's just up there you hanging win, out buddy. Just by himself. <laughs> yeah, you win. Well, leave me alone. <laughs> That's your story arc. Uh, and on the villainous side of things, there are too many rivals that <laughs> come around to be. You know, at least on semi good terms. I mean, Shadow and Sonic, they're not friends, but they're not enemies. Not really. No. I keep getting notes saying Rouge is supposed to be more selfish and self serving, but that doesn't make her evil necessarily. There's that stupid dark definition where they're not good, but they're not bad. Like Jet and the Babylon Rogues, they're jerks, they're antagonists, but if you take away that antagonism and just make them friendly rivals on the racetrack that makes them exceedingly boring and you can't turn Eggman he's the main antagonist (laughs) you would have to put in a new antagonist and I'm not going to swap Eggman for Tails that that just does not have legs on it no 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 no. despite Eggman's exceedingly long stick legs it does not have legs (laughs) you are correct I mean I'm a little surprised with just how much Mr. Tinker gained a fandom like i am really surprised how many people want that interpretation back but that's not really eggman that's mr tinker it's a different character when you get down to it it's not eggman having seen the light and come around to being a good guy that would be an interesting arc sure and to have eggman as a willing ally to sonic that could be interesting but what do you do after that where is the antagonistic force coming from and if you've got the might of the eggman empire on the side of good where are the stakes man that's what's interesting is you have this giant mechanical empire and one little blue hedgehog taking it on Mm -hmm. if they're all on the same side then they win (laughs) no (laughs) i don't know it's maybe i'm maybe i'm too deep into it that i it's hard for me to see alternatives but i kind of feel like the characters and their alignments as they're set are good and if you miss with that formula you'd have to commit it couldn't be a storyline where they change back at the end because that that's fun for a arc that that could be a neat exploration of the character but if you don't commit to it then what really is the point ultimately what are you doing with it? If you're setting up a one-time battle thing, then sure, that's something. Like with the inner Knuckles arc, that was the culmination of a lot of storylines coming into one. And it moved Knuckles' character into a new position within the narrative. The fact that he went full villain was kind of the narrative device. There was no commitment to that. It was just what moved the story along. I think what Dove was asking is, you know, if it was a permanent switch. Yes. You know, to really shake up the dynamic. And I don't really see the appeal of doing it to anybody that we have right now. What about Blaze? <sighs> we kind of get away with it for her. You could, but I don't want to lose Blaze. I don't she's either. She's cool. I know, I know. <laughs> I know she's cool, but you can kind of get, you can kind of do it. Yeah, you could. I I don't want to though. I like Blaze as she is. I know. I don't wanna. I, know. I know. I know. Uh, it's fro- we'll Froggy. Froggy goes evil or big. Yeah. <laughs> Sonic accidentally runs over Froggy while sprinting across the planet. 
And Big just <laughs> loses it. <laughs> Instead of an egg man, you will have a big as terrible and beautiful as the dawn. <laughs> Bow before me and despair. <laughs> Uh, yes that's it that's right that's what we got right there that's what we got there <laughs> all right here we go here's one from pc the unicorn we've seen metal sonic express emotions such as anger fear hesitation and envy but is he capable of being happy what would it take for him to be happy to become sonic <laughs> to be sonic the one true sonic he will never be sonic though that's, is that his is that his problem ultimately yeah. ultimately yep it will never be sonic and here's a question from possible lore bumbler blaze's origin has come up a few times lately on the show and you've mentioned you're unsure how her 06 and rush appearances might connect is the idea that she was tossed into the soul dimension as a result of her shimmering fade out at the end of 06 just a fan theory that i've mixed up with canon like Sonic was in Rush Adventure and IDW, in the latter case, even including Amnesia. I'd assume the latter had been a direct callback, in fact. But, thinking about this, I can't remember where I'd heard that idea initially. Please help me, oh Bumble King, keeper of Sonic lore. So, Blaze is a mess. <laughs> I, let's just be frank about it. <laughs> she, she, um, really needs, she really needs therapy. Oh wait, that's not what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> like the fandom has put a herculean effort into trying to reconcile things but it really hinges on fanon being taken as true and if you take just what we are given in the game material it doesn't fit so here's what i'm talking about when blaze was first introduced in the english media she was just said to be a princess in the British media, she was said to be from a future where everyone had special powers, not just silver. And in the Japanese media, it specifies that she's an imperial princess, which is worlds different than your European style princess. So that right there shows me that there's not really a cohesive through line. In 06, there is no tangible connection to Rush. There's the mention of Blue Hedgehog, but that was a translation error or a localization flub, I should say. Uh, the scene in particular is Blaze is reflecting on Silver's vision of the future, where Silver witnesses a Blue Hedgehog, which he blames as the Iblis trigger and the cause of all their problems. The Japanese word used in that instance can be translated as blue or as naive. And one of the key descriptors that they always tagged with Silver, especially then, was that he was naive. So in the Japanese, Blaze is reflecting on the duality of the word. Is it the blue hedgehog or is it the naive hedgehog that causes the end of the world? Because Silver was sent back in time to kill Sonic, which is what releases Iblis ultimately and dooms them all. That's that's the nuance to Mephilus' plan, is Silver is the Iblis trigger in the end because he's the one who's supposed to set things off and then when he doesn't mephilus just time travels and kills sonic himself which he should have done in the first place but that's besides the point <laughs> so a lot of people thought that line in english was her remembering events in rush when it's really just a poorly localized line it probably would have been better if she was reflecting on the idea of the powerful hedgehog since that would apply to both sonic and silver at the end of 06, it isn't just that she turns to shimmers. She turned, she's supposed to be turning into Burning Blaze. And I feel okay stating that just because the 06 script got leaked in its entirety. And in there it specifies that she disappears as Burning Blaze. I can't remember if it specifies if she goes into an alternate dimension or what. But it is saying that at the end, it's supposed to be Burning Blaze. It... Oh, yeah, yeah. She does say she's going to seal it in another dimension. So, and I think you can kind of see it in the CG, but she's so transparent, it's hard to dig out. Now we go to Rush. And Rush, she's an imperial princess of an entirely different dimension. If she originates from the future with Silver, how is she the imperial princess 
of an entire other planet. If she's the guardian of the soul emeralds and she is cursed by their flames, how is that ever established? How can she grow up with that duty and to be so removed from the people around her because of their fear of her flames if she just appeared there whenever? How did she disappear from 200 years in the future on Sonic's planet to roughly Sonic's time in her own dimension, if that even crossovers properly? And then in subsequent appearances after that, Silver and Blaze both have no memory of those events, so they just kind of feel like they're in sync. Ugh, it's it's not well put together, no matter how you approach it. Now, to me, it kind of seems like possibly the soul dimension is just a manifestation of Iblis's power. Like, maybe Blaze conjured it into being when she popped over to that other dimension. And you could you could play some fun stuff with that, but that's not canon. And that would take a lot of story to explain. So in the end, what Blaze's relationship is to all of this is a mess. It's <laughs> not well put together. And frankly, at this point, it would probably be more of a hassle trying to iron out all the wrinkles than just to move forward. Yeah. Also, if Leah's just going to drop in like that, we really need to get her mic'd up. <laughs> <laughs> we need to just set up a mic for her that she could just go over to and be like, oh, here's my drop in and then leave. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> All right. And we have one final question here from Sapphire Scarletta. In issue 40 of the IDW comics in one of the covers, we finally get a small reference to Infinite by him pledging to Dr. Eggman's live stream with his very famous quote, weak. That got me thinking, would Infinite be a gamer or a live streamer himself? If you guys think so, what kinds of games do you guys see him playing? On the one hand, I don't see him being on a, being a gamer streamer. On the other hand, he would be like that really anti charismatic guy who just streams himself playing like Fort battlefield Fortnite, or... <laughs> no, nothing that colorful one of those first person serious <laughs> tactical shooters and like completely obliterating people left right and center until shadow logs on to the opposing team and snipes them from across the map and then he just completely freaks out and rage quits and like deletes his channel and then a week later starts it up again mm-hmm <laughs> It's Call of Duty. That's what he plays. There you go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Counter-Strike. Yes. And he's constantly insulting your mom. <laughs> your uh. mother is weak. <laughs> what does that even mean, dude? <laughs> your comeback is weak. I wasn't even a comeback. <laughs> uh, man. Boom. Headshot. Your brain pan is weak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh man. I wish we could have actually been able to tell that it was Liam O'Brien's voice in the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh well. And that's it. That's uh that's all we got for questions this week or uh, today actually. Not this week. We got more this week, but yep. Yeah. Big thank you to everyone who makes this show possible. Daniel H, Alex P, James K, John B, Jennifer R, Robotnik, Home, Samuel P, Sam Cybercat, Torchbound, Justin G, Mike B, Coupling Crew 128, Duas, Din, Diane W, Bradley TT, Andrew D, Scruffy Matt, Chris A, Sony, Salute Cat, John M, Noni, Dave M, Off, Dawn B, Yummy M, Sin Fritz, Lee H, K, Lisa M, Silly Strange Fell, J Frost, Piggy Bank, Jib, Hero of Light 13, Blue Title Gamer, Tick Tick, Justin S. Final, Neil, Ryan D. Speedweed, Jonathan D. Rachel W. Godzilla, Chaos Universe, Sonic Legacy, Daniel B. Dattler, The Dalek PC, The Unicorn, Dove, Preston M. Red, The Supernamic, Pen Dolce, Joe S. Chad, Jonathan R. <sighs> Chase L, Owen B D, Ben Wolfsbane, Renard Pixel, Creative Name, Les Invade Turbo Tunis, Danny the Light, Sapphire, Scarlet Turbo, Crooker, John the Real Waluigi, Noah S, Carlos Lewis J, Lexi Loves Jojo, Cordero Highland, Kimiko, Bad Piggies Lover, Alphamon Yurikin, Michi, Michael, Xanderoni the Painter, Phyllis, Scurvy Pirate Hog, Koloki, and Possible Lore Bumble. Hello, Fire Red XY. Sorry, we 
Didn't you get a special call out. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to you. Thank you everyone who supports the show. We will see you Wednesday for a whole standard Q&A episode. Indeed. Now get out of here. Go on, get. What are you doing? Is the Sonic the Hedgehog cast have no idea that tons of people... Oh, I misread that. Yup. Take two. Is is the Sonic the Hedgehog cast? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Shadow was not the imposter. You're the fake hedgehog around here. Sir, so just like, I'm not even a hedgehog. <laughs> Say what you want, man. You put coffee beans on your dog. I know, right? Sonic, I still hate you. I don't care. The dogs, the beans, no. You've been listening to The Bumblecast, a co-production of Bumble King Comics and the KNGI Network. Original theme music composed by Ken Coda Snyder. Remixed intro by T. Lopes. Find out more information, along with podcast feeder links, MP3 downloads, and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org. But we're going to wrap it up with a big thank you to everyone who makes this show possible. Thank you to... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you threw off my Dude, groove, I'm man. sorry. I'm sorry. Because Discord cut out right at a... Right at a... Either a very, a very bad moment or a very good one. <laughs> because it said everyone who... It said everyone who makes this shit possible. <laughs> so it sounded like it makes this shit possible <laughs> almost <laughs> everyone who makes this sh- possible jesus christ anyway go ahead <laughs>